A lot is changing in our world, faster and in more places than any of us are used to. Change is good, but can sometimes leave people behind. That's why we created the TD Ready Commitment, targeting $1 billion to organizations working towards a more inclusive and sustainable tomorrow. Because we believe that by working together, we can help improve people's lives. Hello and welcome. I'm Malika Kapoor, Deputy Global Editor of Bloomberg Live, and I'm excited to be your host for the Road to Net Zero, a virtual briefing. Corporations and investors globally are working to align with the Paris Agreement's goal of limiting warming to well below 2 degrees Celsius. That will require net zero emissions by 2050. The question is, how do we get there? In a few minutes, you'll hear from leading executives on the challenges and opportunities that arise when transitioning to a low-carbon economy. We'll examine the major industries taking action, how we finance the transition, and how we can collectively work together to achieve net zero. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge our sponsor, TD Bank, and I have a few quick housekeeping announcements to get through. If you experience any issues with audio or video quality, just try to refresh your browser, or you can use the chat box in the bottom right corner of your screen for support. You will be able to submit questions during the interviews, and we do hope you engage with us. And while we probably won't be able to get to all of you, we will try our best. So to submit a question, just click open the white tab on the right side corner, the right-hand side of the video window. And if you include your name and your location, we'll do our best to give you a shout out. Please engage with us on social media. We are active there. And you can use the hashtag, hashtag road to net zero. You can also engage with other attendees in the event chat. Again, you'll find that in the bottom right corner of your screen. And now let's get started with our first session. Please join me in welcoming my colleague Akshat Rati from Bloomberg Green for our first session, Companies Driving Action. Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Akshat Rati, and I'm a reporter here with Bloomberg Green. And we are here talking about net zero because uh, we have a global uh, set of climate goals which require all sectors of the economy, from companies and governments to individuals, to eventually reach uh, zero or net out their emissions to zero to be able to control uh, and slow down climate change. Uh, of course, in the last 12 to 18 months, uh, we've seen a rush of announcements from uh, companies across the world setting these net zero targets. And with us, we have uh, an excellent panel of uh, company executives who can walk us through uh, what it means to set a target of, of this kind, which is typically decades out, and how do you take the steps to get there uh, in uh, in the most uh, in a, uh, sensible manner without having to disrupt business uh, in, uh, in as little uh, way as possible. Uh, so with us, we have Jane Ewing, who is a senior vice president of sustainability at Walmart, uh, Jessica Matthews, who's founder and CEO of Uncharted Power, and Dane Parker, who is the chief sustainability officer of General Motors. Um, and I wanted to start with Dane because uh, General Motors has very recently announced that it's going to go at least carbon neutral on its own operations. What was it like to uh, come up with that plan, uh, announce it, and what do the next years look like? Sure. Thanks, Lakshat. And, and I would tell you, actually, our commitment was to be carbon neutral in our products and our operations. And in our case, our products are about 75% of our footprint. So that's a very seismic shift for us. Um, and we're going to do this with the science-based target methodology path. So we're going to do it primarily by reducing and eliminating um, our emissions. And so, you know, with that for us came our, our aspiration that by 2035, we will eliminate tailpipe emissions. And, and that's 75% of our total footprint, as I mentioned. And so 
you know, for us, we in 2017, we set a vision for zero emissions future and have been working since then to get, get into a place where we're confident in our in our technology and in the things we're doing in our, our own operations, as you mentioned, but but even more importantly in our products, so that uh, we're ready to set this kind of a target. And uh, we're excited and there's gonna be a lot coming in the in the immediate term and in the years to come to get us there. Thank you. Um, similarly, Walmart uh, has set uh, uh, a similar goal going back a few years, uh, but uh, it also addresses, um, as uh, Dane hinted at, um, emissions across uh, the supply chain. Uh, Jane, could you tell us a little more about, uh, you know, what are the top uh, uh, goals that Walmart has set and how Walmart is uh, set to go about achieving them? Yes, of course, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Hello, everyone. Um, we've been working for over 15 years and collaborating with other partners to, to, to endeavor to drive positive impact across our global supply chain and also in all of the communities we operate. So we know how critical this is um, for the world. Um, the fact that the climate change is now being termed a climate crisis meant we knew we needed to double down and be more aggressive. So back in September of last year, we made a we made a new announcement and a new set of goals to become to really raise our ambition and target zero emissions in our own operations by 2040. Um, at the same time, we made a commitment to becoming a regenerative company. This idea that we work to restore and replenish and regenerate um, whilst continuing to deliver on our goals and our purpose. And then in terms of scope three, we work, um, we, in 2017, we launched what we call Project Gigaton. And that is an initiative designed to partner with our suppliers and encourage their partnership to remove a gigaton's worth of emissions out of the atmosphere by 2030. So we're pretty excited about both those initiatives and very committed to making them happen. Um, and Jessica, as uh, as a much smaller company uh, than uh, Walmart or uh, GM, uh, but a company that is actually enabling many of the large companies to reach these goals, what have you found to be most exciting in the space? And also perhaps what's the most challenging part of the job? Well, first, uh, I'd, I'd like to also say thank you. It's it's an honor to be here, not just in this virtual room, but during this time when I think for most of us, the things that we believe to be important are finally urgent to a large enough group in the world uh, for us to have some meaningful and productive conversations. Uh, you know, I, I've been very much, um, I think, inspired by the work that's come before us when we think about uh, the different types of platforms that have been developed to uh, attempt to support um, smart, sustainable infrastructure development. And that's definitely where we focus most at Uncharted, looking at uh, infrastructure and how it really gets properly um, deployed and managed in the built environment. I think the biggest thing that I've noticed is that most smart city platforms, whether they're vertically integrated in terms of one sort of stream around water or uh, energy or uh, parking traffic, et cetera, or if they've attempted horizontal integration um, and, and thinking about how you can uh, sort of provide kind of a very um, rigid uh, solution to, to cities um, or, you know, or, or campuses, et cetera, uh, the biggest thing is that they've always been focusing more on integration versus interoperability. And at the end of the day, we all know as functioning adults that there's a difference between being in the same place and being on the same page. And what we've found essentially is that we have more of the latter, more of the former than the latter happening uh, in, in these situations. We have uh, you know, quite a few smart products being pushed into smart cities, uh, quite a few sustainable products being pushed into these communities, but we're not actually building smart, sustainable communities because we're not prioritizing interoperability. And so when we really thought about what it would mean to create a truly equitable enablement platform uh, that could streamline the development and management of smart, sustainable infrastructure, we knew that that's what we essentially would have to focus on. And so for us, that meant really prioritizing standardization 
the standardization of physical and digital interfaces to streamline everything from how you would co-locate uh, power cables, uh, 5G, you know, 5G uh, infrastructure, et cetera, and the ground uh, to digital twin interfaces that really give you a much more accessible single pane of glass of everything that's going on in your uh, full infrastructure network. So you can start to actually have um, opportunities to learn and address the costs um, and the time to deploy um, and general redundancies that can disincentivize people from making these climate uh, uh, kind of mission statements. Uh, and then I think a really big thing is also looking at how we work with uh, AI and machine learning to have uh, a cloud, a true edge cloud that enables all of this as well, right? Um, instead of kind of saying, hey, here's how you need to build designing something that learns about the different infrastructure solutions, learns about how uh, you know an organization is trying to deliver a, an electric vehicle charging solution, despite the fact that there's all these silos with power, with uh, infrastructure development, et cetera, um, and then produces something that can give them what we all want, right? Which is economies of scale. Uh Thanks. Yeah. And um, in, I mean, in reaching these net zero goals, there's, uh, there's a uh, need for technology as, as uh, Jessica pointed out, but there's also the need for uh, transparency and reporting your progress. Uh, and uh, maybe Jane, you could tell us a little bit more about what Walmart does to not just set the goal, but once the goal has been set, uh, how you update uh, your audiences and uh, the public about reaching these goals, what sort of reporting um, measures are taken to do that? Yes, of, co of course. Um, so we estimate our direct, indirect and partial supply chain emissions in accordance with the greenhouse gas protocol. And we've actually been reporting this um, annually since 2006. We also report to the CDP um, and happily, both in 2019 and 2020, we we made the A-list for climate action. And we just heard last week that we uh, made the supplier engagement leaderboard. And for those of you who are familiar with CDP, you'll know it's a very comprehensive and detailed analysis that requires you to look at all, all areas of the, of the organization. And then in terms of our... Um, in addition to our own operations, sorry, um, on Project Gigaton that I just spoke about, we ask our suppliers to set emission reduction goals. And we actually have a platform, a technological platform that they can do that. Um, and then we and they together track their progress. So it really does allow us to hold each other accountable. Um, and then we obviously report those findings in our ESG report and, um, and other areas, but we issue that every year. Uh, there are a lot of questions about the role of carbon offsets uh, in net zero strategy. Of course, the net part of uh, net zero is uh, an assumption or at least uh, an allowance of using uh, carbon offsets. And maybe, Dane, you can uh, mention whether carbon offsets, you know, what do you think about them and whether GM um, aims to use uh, carbon offsets in its uh, route to reaching uh, carbon neutrality? Sure. So certainly I think there are roles in places for carbon offsets and they can be an important way of helping direct resources to the most effective way of reducing carbon in total. Um, but as for us at GM, our goal is, is primarily to not use carbon offsets, but in fact to achieve absolute reduction through our own operations and through our products. In our, you know, in our products, transitioning to electric vehicles is the most important lever for that. So we're investing significant resources in doing that and changing our products. And then, of course, the way those products are powered, which is energy, is another really key element. So enabling the growth of renewable energy and, um, and, the, and the greening of the grid as fast as possible is, a, is another really important element for us. So as we look, our, our goals are primarily fo focused around reductions of the scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions associated with you know the, the operations and the products we have. Um, and we would view carbon offsets in, in the very end as netting those things that otherwise we can't reduce. But we're even looking at industrial heating in alternative ways like hydrogen so that we can eliminate that carbon. So elimination is our is our primary focus. 
Right. And um, Jessica, one other aspect I wanted to touch upon is even as a uh, as a firm with with a smaller uh, you know carbon footprint, what is it that you're doing within the company to address the the small carbon footprint that you do have? Um, and have you set your own net zero goal as a company? You know, I think as an organization, we're so small uh, that it, we wouldn't even know exactly how to really honestly focus in those resources. Uh, but that said, it's very much been part of our ethos as a company to be smart and sustainable in everything that we do. So whether it's uh, actually shifting to an entirely remote uh, team, right, and only focusing in on having people going to a physical space for work uh, when it's critically necessary in the development of our hardware systems has already been uh, an area where we're really excited to demonstrate the uh, the social, um, I think, and sustainable uh, commitment that we're hoping to make in simply being a more efficient company across the board. I think that said, you know, where we have been able to track our targets and, and numbers is really looking at how we can promote the adoption of more sustainable and smart solutions in the broader communities, right? So our team is uh, less than 40 people broadly in a modular workforce, uh, less than 10 people who are actually full-time. So it becomes a bit minuscule to track, but when we're working in communities that are over 30,000 individuals, we start to see the big push there. Uh, and what we have found ultimately is that in as much as we're very excited to see the uh, more political incentives around uh, offsetting you know, carbon, et cetera, we really do need technological solutions that just make it easier, that just make it more convenient to do this. Uh, and so what we've been looking at is how do we use data in particular to show that this is in fact the most cost effective solution from a business perspective, even if we we have a shift in policies and tax credits that would uh, normally be the core incentive that both cities and businesses would have. Uh, and so our big goal right now, especially in our, our uh, the city that we're working in in Poughkeepsie, is to look at how we can eat into approximately 50 to 90 percent of the cost that normally goes into deploying things like solar microgrids, EV charging stations, uh, smart water systems, uh, smarter traffic systems, et cetera, and really show how not only is this enabling a more sustainable community, uh, but it in fact is good for the bottom line. Right. Um, a follow up on uh, your question, uh, your answer, uh, Jane, that uh, in setting your uh, gigaton target, for example, you also get your supply chain to report on their progress. What sort of um, resources do you have to provide them? Um, or you know, what kind of help do they ask for in making sure that them, they themselves are reducing their carbon footprint, which would of course help you reach the gigaton goal? Yes. Yeah, so um, on the on the gigaton initiative, we've actually got over 2,300 suppliers that have already engaged, and we've tried to make it um, um, easy to access, and then that it builds up over time. So the first thing we do is we give them access to the platform and we ask them to set a goal. But then we provide tools um, to help them navigate those goals and, and achieve them. So we've actually got goals in several different areas. So energy would be one, waste, packaging, um, agriculture, forests, and then product use and design. So they can start in any of those areas. And what we find is they usually start with one or two, um, and then they'll build up to, to more. And we provide a set of tools. We have workshop, regular workshops in the different areas to kind of help them raise the bar. And, you know, one example I'd like to call out is we, um, towards the end of last year, we raised, um, we developed in partnership with Snyder Electric a, um, what we call a gigaton PPA initiative. So we offer suppliers a way to accelerate their renewable energy adoption. And often these suppliers may not be able to do that on their own, but by combining forces, um, they can do that and hopefully it will help give the smaller suppliers access to renewables and then accelerate the use. So as much as we can try and do things that are gonna help raise the bar for everybody, um, we work pretty hard to, to do that. Right, and uh, Dean, I mean, you also have a huge supply chain. Are there uh, differences in, in how, uh, you know, Jane described uh, Walmart approaches uh, their 
supply chain chain emissions from how you do it and are there differences in you know what sort of resources your suppliers ask for actually i heard a lot of similarities and and i think walmart's been a great leader along with other companies like unilever and engaging their supply chains and so we've we've um used some very similar methodologies. We've had workshops on reporting. We've helped suppliers understand and have access to tools to be able to do that. Something that we found really effective that we, we did last year was we created a supplier sustainability council. So we have senior leaders, senior executives from a series of our, of our biggest suppliers that meet together and help one another and ask questions, um, share ideas, share, share best practices, share learnings. We're fortunate to have amongst our suppliers some, some really great companies themselves, big companies that lead in their industries and are passionate about sustainability. So, I, you know, we've brought them together and uh, we're learning from one another on the journey and we're seeing, you know, a great deal of enthusiasm and support as, you know, they embrace common goals. And we've also asked them to set their own goals, to publicly disclose those goals, and uh, we work with them to help. Right. Um, and Jessica, in uh, working with uh, you know uh, larger companies, either to uh, access uh, services, but also either to supply them, uh, you know, what kind of uh, feedback do you get from companies, uh, you know, when they are either using your services for uh, uh, meeting climate goals? You know, a lot of our work right now has been more in the pilot stage. And so a lot of the feedback is really more part of the development process, right? Um, our biggest thing is looking at how can we streamline their what they're trying to do in the first place, right? How can we create more value and cut costs? Uh, I would say... The biggest things that have been, uh, I think, focused on over the last year or two, and I think about the work that we've done, um, not only locally within cities, but even in conversations we've had with, uh, for example, uh, Disney, um, who's an investor uh, in the company. Uh, the, the biggest thing is really understanding our materials. Uh, so, for example, something as small as even selecting FRP, fiber reinforced polymer, as the core material in our physical paver. Uh, it's a pretty standard serviceable paver, something you can put in the ground so you don't have this dig once issue. Calculating the sustainability around this, not just because we're no longer sourcing concrete, which is actually somewhat unsustainable when you think about the core beach sand uh, that's required, uh, but also looking at uh, the sustainability and not having to rip up the ground again and being able to calculate that with, with accuracy as we think about different projects that might be possible. Um, looking at even the, the volumetric weight um, of the system when we think about shipping. These are things that do come up in the conversations are very, very much relevant. But we have honestly found that ultimately the bottom line is something that everyone needs to care about. And the sustainability officers that we've engaged are, are usually saying, I, I need to present almost like triple bottom line solutions here uh, to ensure that the, the legacy of this, this uh, program uh, lives on. And so we've, we've had some fun kind of coming together, you know, with these partners and saying, hey, face value, we're, we're a win, we're an MWBE, we care about sustainability, but we also really care about improving the bottom line on your sustainability efforts. And here's how we are thinking about doing this. And so uh, there's a couple of things we'll be showing actually in, in, a, in a few months, uh, just in upstate New York, in terms of how we're working to enable uh, different uh, infrastructure solution companies uh, within an actual city. But there's quite a bit more that we think is gonna come along over the next year or two uh, as we start to get the support from the federal government as well. All right, we're coming up to the close of our time. So I'm gonna ask one final question uh, and it'll be the same one for all of you. Um, and I'll, I'll start uh, with Jessica. Is that what's the one solution towards cutting emissions that currently most excites you? Um, okay. and, and how do you see it fitting in, in your work? That clarifying point at the end was quite important because one solution is uh, not possible. Uh, I mean, obviously I'm biased, but I'm the most excited about interoperability. Uh, I still truly believe that the number one thing holding back uh, the universal access to, to sustainable infrastructure solutions is the siloed development and management of this infrastructure. Uh, and so I think to the extent that we can 
de-silo uh, the different infrastructure solution companies and the way that they engage with each other and the way that they work with the cities uh, in the way that they also deliver these solutions to the citizen, to the extent that we can de-silo that, not just through kind of uh, standard integration, but really thinking about the interoperability uh, of these systems and how they can grow from there. That gets really exciting because in the last decade or so, at least for, for me, being a, a millennial, um, which means nothing now that the Gen Zers are taking over, uh, but you know, it's the social platforms were, were, were unbelievable in the way that they they just created new worlds for us, right? Um, in the way that they engaged people, pulled people in, and found those nuanced opportunities to build from things that we, we couldn't imagine if they remained in silos. That's what we're missing in the built environment. So being able to build, bring some of that magic of, you know, my era of Facebook, et cetera, um, and think about that in terms of democratizing a sustainable infrastructure, that's yeah. by far one of the most exciting things for me. Right. And what about you, Dane? Well, I, I'm most excited about the electrification of transportation. Um, of mm -hmm. course, that's self-interested, but um, it is one of the larger contributors to um, greenhouse gas emissions globally and something that we all rely on in so many ways. You know, every single day, transportation is critical of goods, services, and of course, of people. So, I, you know, the electrification of trans transportation is the, for me, the biggest sea change in our industry since we went from horses and buggies to automobiles. And uh, I can't help but be excited about that. And and obviously, the the greening of the electrical infrastructure itself and the greening of the grid and renewable energy is probably a close second for us. Wonderful. Uh, and Jane? I completely agree, Jessica. I wish there was one solution, but there isn't. I mean, it's you know, it's really going to require multiple solutions. But I think I would call out uh, the need for technological innovation. So exactly as you just said, Dane. You know, we need. Um, the electrification of our fleet of trucks to be able to deliver on our commitment to zero emissions. So hopefully you can help us out with that that one, Dane. Um, you know, we need low impact refrigerants um, to be able to, to deliver on that goal. So I think, um, and Jessica, early you mentioned, you know, AI, there's also blockchain. I think there's multiple things we need from a technology perspective that are going to help us accelerate towards those goals. Wonderful. Well, uh, that's our time. Thank you all for uh, your thoughts. Uh, we've had a wonderful con conversation. Uh, thanks, Jessica, Jane, and Dane. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Shanali Basak. I'm a financial reporter for Bloomberg Television in New York. We have a panel from all over the world today. We have Amy West, Managing Director and Global Head of Sustainable Finance and Corporate Transitions uh, at TD Securities. We have Sean Kidney joining us from Australia, co-founder and CEO of the Climate Bonds Initiative. And we have Deborah Ng, uh, head of responsible investing at the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan. So major Canadian investor. Thank you all three of you for joining us. I think one good place to start is by measuring the impact. There's a lot of talk about green initiatives rising on the mind of investors. But if we're looking at how much that translates to in dollars, what does that mean? And maybe, Sean, you can get us started there. Well, I mean, the thematic market, which is uh, bonds where the proceeds go towards addressing climate change or addressing social investments or sustainable investments or related, which are the daughters of green bonds, if you like, uh, is booming. You know, we... Uh, we had uh, something like, six, according to, to um, Bloomberg figures, something like 760 uh, billion of issuance last year, I think it is, and we are sitting at about 1.7 trillion outstanding. The green bond market, which is the area I most intimately work in, is sitting at about uh, $1.1 trillion outstanding at the moment. So it's not exactly huge compared to the overall bond market, which is uh, 100 trillion, but it's pretty good and growing fast. What I'm going to say is the investor demand is extraordinary. The level of oversubscription for these thematic bonds is way higher than normal bonds. And when I speak to my investors, 
they simply can't get enough. Their asset owners are telling them they're interested in this automatic portfolio. And this is washing over, by the way, to equities and, uh, and other instruments as well. So it's, you know, it's, a, it's an exciting time to be in it, which is weird, right? We've just had a brutal pandemic. We've just had a collapse of economies in some places. But there's a story there. People are realising that the capital with purpose story is a story of the times. Well, that's interesting. I'm wondering, Amy, if you could weigh in there on, you know, what do you think the pandemic has done to really um, add to this conversation about ESG? Is there a link to the two? You know, I, I agree with, with Sean's comments and the question. For those of us involved in the markets, I have to be honest, if I said there wasn't a bit of uncertainty and unease as the pandemic set in, you know, what would this do to what we still talk about as a bit of a nascent market? And as Sean said, the ESG markets are still much smaller than the overall debt markets. And we hadn't been through a systemic financial shock since the financial crisis, really in earnest. And so this was the first time since this market is, I would say, come of age to have that happen. And in that context, I think that I was blown away by how positive the response was to this type of thematic investing. You know, we saw more transactions get done, and in particular, social transactions, social bonds were seven times higher in issuance levels this year, 2020, sorry, pardon me, last year, 2020, than we'd ever seen before. And so there was really a response from the global investor base that this wasn't just about doing the right thing, but this was an indicator of success. You've seen it with some recent articles from institutions like BlackRock, where we saw outperformance of a number of the sustainably focused funds. And if you look at the UNPRI numbers from the end of last year, there's more money being managed in the world today through a thematic lens than there's ever been before. I would actually go so far as to say that the amount of money that's not using ESG is, is rapidly dwindling. So I, I do think this is here to stay, and I do think we'll continue to see more focus on it. The pandemic, in my mind, only really helped to crystallize ESG as a material financial risk. Well, what, that's interesting. And Deborah, maybe we can bring in an investor's perspective here. ESG is a broad category. Uh, and Amy brought up a great point about the social bonds, for example. When you're looking at this category, how do you kind of divide and conquer among uh, the ES and G elements of it? Yeah, I mean, that's an excellent question and one that I come across a lot. And, and, you know, we've always been trying to sort of say, you know, how do you how do you ascribe, you know, how much performance do you get from looking at ESG factors or looking at ESG investments? Uh, but the fact of the matter is it's exactly that. that there's so many different um, elements and types of investments that are wrapped into sort of that ESG header that um, I think you really need to break it down and, and think about, you know, where does plan, you know, for us as investors, where do we have, um, where do we want to have impact? Where do we want to invest? Where do we see as the greatest opportunity, right? So from the environmental side, you know, we're seeing a lot of opportunities really on decarbonization technologies, and that's a huge area of focus for us. On the social side, it's really about maybe positive impact. We're thinking about issues like inequality and education and, and investing in those areas as well. So I think it's, um, I think investors are getting pickier about the ESG themes that they're going to be looking at versus trying to sort of say, hey, we're going to allocate ESG broad. So one more note on social here, Amy. When you're saying that more people are looking at social bonds, what does that look like? Where does that money go? I think that the difference between the traditional, and Sean said it right, green markets per se, which were environmentally focused use of proceeds transactions, the social category is much bigger. It could be a number of social initiatives from things like affordable housing all the way through to the response to the pandemic. Healthcare spending was obviously a significant portion of the focus in the past 12 months. And so social bonds really pick up categories that are, are again, not environmental, but we know have real societal benefit. And that's something that up until now, because it's a little more difficult to quantify impact, had been underrepresented in the ESG markets. Up until last year, we saw green bonds issued at about a three to one multiple to social bonds. And the reason is that we had a lot of metrics that were quantitative that we could rely upon for very credible impact metrics on the back of a green bond. We issued a green bond and here's the impact. We can measure that in, in environmental terms. On social, it's a little bit harder. It's a little bit less clear. 
And so what we saw this year was really, and I think for those of us on the issuer side, on the sell side, um, it was comforting to see the buy side, to see investors getting comfortable with these social transactions coming to market. Well, well, well let's bring that then back to Sean here, because, uh, you know, talking about social versus green bonds, when you speak to investors who are thinking about ESG and want to put their money to work in impact, right, um, do you feel ever that you're competing against uh, these different forces? and interests and uh, what what are what are the conversations like that draw your clients into green versus other places well people are interested first in their capital being used to do good while doing well and one of the things we've proven over the last few years is that people that invest in these things actually do better than the mainstream you know ESG works that actually the the extra data points involved give you a greater prediction of um, sustainable returns. Now, the green and the social are part of that. The EU uh, issuance of social bonds, some 30 billion AAA bonds, is actually working well for people. In, in the German uh, market, where the green bond has been issued at a, at a slight discount to the primary market, they're actually performing eight basis points better in the secondary market than a vanilla bond. Investors know this, investors see this, and what's more, in the downturn, they hold their value. So they're a capital retention tool going forward. So this is one of the things driving it, but fundamentally the customers of investors are saying, why can't I have my capital doing well while doing good? I'm, I'm hearing I can, and uh, investors are responding, really. You know, we have BlackRock responding to this in terms of climate change recently. You have Larry Fink's various letters on this topic. Uh, but they're not the only one. Stay get funds around the world have been doing it. And it's because it is doable. We can make money while doing good. This is what we proved. Green bonds well, uh, have proven uh, the point. Um, I'm so glad you brought up the financial aspect, right? Because a lot of uh, the, the questions around ESG is how, how to place the money and how to make sure that there is a, a, an impact as well as a return. And as far as, um, you know, another point of measurement, right, um, to make this market advance further, what do we need to be measuring better than we have had before? So one of the things we've talked about is the need to understand, make it easy for people to understand what are the right kinds of investments. We've done that with a thing called a taxonomy. It's now become part of the European regulatory landscape to bring in a taxonomy of definitions for sustainable investments, guidance. So, look, you need to know that a solar farm is in. You don't need to do a complicated trans report on why a solar farm is in. You need to know that green buildings of a certain sort are in. You don't need to know... Or you don't need to make the justification yourself about this. We're trying to make it easy for the market to go forward. And critical to all of this is this idea that when we get to, in the green space, when we get to green investments, we must be addressing the Paris Agreement. It's a clear underlying requirement of the whole market. And in the social space, it's actually related as well. You know, the European investment, you saw the European Commission's uh, $30 billion of sure bonds are uh, looking for uh, funding unemployment relief in the European Union are linked both to the recovery of the pandemic, but also the building of resilience. The 750 billion European Resilience and Recovery Fund asked demands that member states actually look at the arguments of what they're doing to, to, to create resilience. So, you know, so guidance is becoming the norm. Central banks are adopting this guidance. Christine Lagarde right. at, the, at the European Central Bank is going to do green quantitative easing based on taxonomy. We're making it easy. We're making it that's easy. A great, that's a great point to, uh, to bring in Deborah in, because when you look at your investment opportunities around the world, right, uh, you do see more governments and central banks starting to take action, starting to work together, maybe, maybe not in some cases. Uh, how does this change your calculus? What do you need to see, and how does it make it difficult to invest in some areas versus others, like the United States, for example, that has changed its course on the Paris Agreement in the last couple of years and, and maybe reversing now. Yeah, reverse I mean, that's, yeah, that's exactly that's exactly the right question when we think about it. Um, Ontario Teachers, of course, is a very long-term investor. Uh, we have members uh, with pensions that are going to, you know, uh, they're going to 
contribute to the pensions for 30 years, they're going to be retired for 30 years. So we're looking at over a 60-year horizon. And, and so while we've been heartened um, by the um, amount of countries that have been committing to net zero, I think 50% of the countries by GDP and by emissions have committed to net zero, that just gives us a lot more um, ammunition when we go out there and, and look for sort of uh, investments in, in climate technology. Uh, and then where the risk comes, of course, is, is not being able to rely on having stable long-term climate policies. So um, I think it's a bit of both. Like, we're, we're very heartened to see the countries that are committing to it. But as a long-term investor, we also have to consider, you know, the likelihood for a country that we're investing in to change their policy, to scale back on a climate and because that, that is going to impact the value of our investment. Um, Amy, you're, I love your opinion on this, too, because for a long time, and I covered investors and banks for you know a number of years here at Bloomberg, and over and over they keep saying Europe just has it better. They've been more consistent. This is a much bigger market in Europe. And so when you're talking to investors, you know, uh, does that mean that, what does it mean for them to have that kind of lead? And what would it take for other regions to catch up? It's a great question and an interesting one, right? I, I think that the point made by Deborah was a good one. Consistency of regulatory support and the, the political will to have that consistency is something that we haven't seen for the past at least four to five years in the U.S. And, and so I think that from the perspective of on a going forward basis, the U.S. rejoining COP20, uh, sorry, the Paris Climate Accord um, and COP26 coming up are going to be transformational. But interestingly, from my perspective, we already saw a lot of interest out of North American investors in ESG for two reasons. One was a lot of the global investors that happen to be U.S. domiciled funds already are significant investors in other markets where this is the law of the land. And so if you're a big global investor, you don't traditionally go to the jurisdiction with the most lax requirements and implement that policy. You usually implement the more stringent policy. And once you understand as an investor how to implement, it gives you a competitive advantage. A lot of investors would argue that, and Deborah could obviously expound on that. But I will say that in my opinion in the U.S., I think that the investors that engaged in ESG have not done so because of regulatory reasons. They've done so because of capitalist reasons. And in some ways, I think on a longer term scale, that will position them well for success. It's rare that consistently you see governments lead innovation. The private sector throughout history has traditionally led on innovation, and I don't expect this to be different. So it's fabulous that the consistent regulatory environment in Europe has created a breeding ground for the private sector, but it's a careful balance between doing that and stifling innovation. And so I think that that's going to be the next iteration here. And to answer one early question from you, if I can just ask, say one more thing, I think consistency of reporting and if regulation requires that would be a huge boon for the market going forward. Okay, so I, I will go back to reporting in a second, but on the vein of reporting, when you think about it, uh, and you know, this is the road to net zero, this is what can we do to get to zero faster. Um, Sean, where do greenwashing concerns fall uh, for you? I mean, what are some examples of things that might concern you as you do your job every day? Well, I want to say first that there isn't really much greenwashing. We don't have the intent here. The only greenwashing I know of for certain was a Syracuse, New York property developer in 2008 who just got a green bond tax credit and then decided, hey, I got the money, I don't need to do anything. Uh, that's about it. Uh, in the meantime, people are following through. If you, what, what we mean by greenwashing is more that people make claims to environmental benefit and those claims are disputable. So we have a lot of that. You know, if a gas company says, I'm going to reduce emissions by 20%, Hey, that sounds good, right? Well, actually, if you're looking at what we have to do to achieve the power agreement, it's not good. You need to get much steeper reductions in emissions in the gas sector to meet the challenges of the Paris Agreement. So that kind of discussion and understanding about what are the right investments is what's needed here. You know, if Suncor in Alberta decides to pursue energy efficiency and reduce its emissions, is that a good thing or is that not a good thing? That's the question. 
Now, actually, the challenge is we've actually got to get Suncor to shift to bitumen production and away from combustible oil to make the transition. So this year, you'll see a lot more detail coming through about frameworks for investors to review the environmental credentials of what I'd call transition industries, oil and gas, steel, cement. We're pretty clear on things like buildings and renewable energy and so on, but we've got to tackle the tough sectors of society and show the pathway to go through. And that's how we address this greenwashing, which is actually a lack of understanding. Uh, Amy, Deborah, do both of you agree, or, or is greenwashing a, a bigger concern? I mean, I think, you know, it goes back to the reporting, right? Um, you know, for, as an investor, we need to have transparency to understand if companies are undertaking greenwashing, right? And I think, you know, Sean brought some really good examples of, of companies that have made commitments. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, it comes down to performance. It comes down to the actual numbers you're able to achieve, right? So you can set yourself a 20% target or a 50% target, but if we're not seeing those numbers in your emissions going down, then as investors, we're kind of going, well, you know, we're going to be a little bit more skeptical about, you know, their their transition plans. So I think, you know, reporting is, is absolutely key. We need to have this information in order to make that decision. Uh, it needs to be consistent because I need to be able to look at Suncor. I need to, you know, part of a lot of the EU taxonomy is really based on sector norms. It's based on what is the best technology that the sector can do to, to, to achieve decarbonization? So in order to get there, you need to have all the companies within the sector sort of providing that reporting so that you can kind of take a look and say, well, where, how does this company perform next to their, their peers? And are they, are they doing better or worse? Can they do more? So I think it's going to be up to reporting and verification of those numbers and, and, and performance. Amy, you know, it's funny, uh, reporting has been an issue as long as I've covered this. <laughs> it's been an issue for so long. And I'm wondering when you look at this year ahead and if you could create an, an actionable way to make this a fixable issue, um, you know, a few things that you would need for reporting to be clearer uh, across borders. Uh, what do you think the big innovations in reporting will be this year? <laughs> So, so it's interesting. I think that we've had a lot of support in the green, social, and sustainable bond market for harmonized impact reporting. And the handbooks that have come out from ICMA have gone a long way in standardizing that. I actually think the area that we could improve the most would be on actual corporate sustainability reporting. And I think that that's going to be increasingly important given the uptick in interest around sustainability linked debt offerings this year. Because suddenly it's not just about what the proceeds of that specific bond are going to, but it's holistically. How's the company measuring forward progress? And so institutions like the GRI, SASB, TCFD, these are going to become really important because in these reports, it's going to allow investors to, on a more apples-to-apples -apples basis, compare what companies are doing. And we all are aware that as a company continues down this journey to net zero, there's an argument to be made that your, your first few years in this journey are going to be easier in some ways than as you continue this journey because you're going to be tackling some of the easier-to-approach projects and initiatives. But just because your percentage improvement goes down, that doesn't actually mean that you're not doing as good of a job. It just means that you're tackling potentially some of the harder problems down the road. So I think that alignment of to some of the global standards will help a lot in terms of what investors are looking for and being able to compare across the market. So that leads me to my next kind of question that um, I think about a lot. And uh, Sean, are we moving fast enough? We're talking about the road to net zero. I see a corporate announcement a day about it, right? Uh, are we moving fast enough? Well, patently not. I mean, that's why we're getting climate impacts around the world now. That's why the Arctic in North of Canada is warming at an unbelievable level. And uh, it, in fact, if you look at the cold that we're experiencing in the US at the moment, it's because the Arctic is too warm and is pushing cold air down. That warmth is really scary. And we're not moving fast enough. We've got about a trillion dollars going into the right kind of investments. It needs to be five to seven trillion dollars a year. 
So the scale we have to achieve is way above where we are now. Now, a lot of that will be redirecting capital flows. You know, if you're investing in transport, stop investing in freeways, invest in mass transit. Well, it's a post-COVID story, not so good in the middle of COVID, but you get the idea. Uh, so absolutely right, long way to go. We've got green shoots. The good news is that there is capital moving and we see the demand being unquenchable now for the kind of capital. The other good news is that we have countries moving. 110 countries have committed to 2050 net zero targets and the US looks like it's about to on top of that. Now we've got to deliver on that. Europe has also committed to 2030, 55% cuts. That's what the whole world needs to do. So the, the target settings are coming together this year in a way they were not pre-pandemic. But folks, we've got to do it now. We've got to deliver. And that's going to mean some very tough decisions about industrial policy. Don't get me wrong. This will create jobs, jobs, jobs and jobs. The kinds of investments we need to make in terms of shifting our economies will create a 30-year boom, in my view, because of the vast capex in areas where there are jobs. But we've got to get going. It's a bit like infrastructure in the US. We've been talking about it now for eight years and we're still letting the whole thing turn into a decrepit mess. We've got to get going and start investing. So speaking of investing for a minute, we are getting this question from the audience now. And from an investor's perspective, what does a company need to consider when they're making a net zero commitment? I'll, I'll jump off and say, is the change strategy they're looking at commensurate with what we actually need to do? That's the key thing. And it's hard if you're a company because you've got to shift your business lines, but there's opportunities in the steel industry, for example. You need to be looking at a shift to recycling with electric arc furnaces and usage of green hydrogen. It's doable. Green hydrogen will be the same price as gas in 10 years' time. So if you get going on that pathway, you will be able to make the transition in a really solid time. In cement, there are low-carbon concrete, same price, already being offered by Lafarge, Heidelberg and so on. We've got to scale it up. We need the help of help from the government on procurement policy to make sure those things grow, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're a company, you look at what the envelope looks like and where you've got to change, and then you look at what settings you need to the system to make sure you can make the change. It may require you to talk to the authorities about energy policy or property policy as part of making that change. There's no doubt that the public sector working at the private sector has to be a theme of making this change going forward. But just remember, ambition, ambition, ambition. So for Deborah, I want to get at this question in a bit of a different way. For, for a country with such a huge energy industry, right, uh, <laughs> how do you balance the road to net zero with that uh, reality? Yeah, I mean, that that is the question, isn't it? Um, you know, I think it's about long-range planning, right? It's about thinking. Um, it's it's about ambition. Uh, you know, as as Sean said, setting the ambition and then setting that roadmap, right? So understanding, um, you know, how to get there. You have to map it out. Like we we need to think about it, and we need to think about it in in a way that is just and orderly, because this is going to be very disruptive for certain sectors. I think a lot of the you know energy intensive resource companies in Canada, you know, have been making progress. They have been you know trying to sort of you know make their operations more efficient, and 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 it is very well regulated um, uh, industry in in Canada. So I think. You know, they're they're taking steps there, but I think we really need to think about it as a as a country strategically and then and then set that roadmap there. So it'll be very interesting, um, you know, how Canada, you know, has set its 2050 commitment, net zero by 2050. We're looking at our 2030 targets now. So, um, you know, we're we're looking to see, you know, what what that's going to look like and, and how that's going to be implemented. And is there frustration, right? I mean, you you are you act on behalf of policyholders, right, or um, retirees, rather, for at, a, at a, such a major retirement pension plan. Um, is there a frustration about uh, moving fast enough, or is there a, a greater concern here about what the job outlook uh, looks like as this transition happens? Yeah, I mean, I think 
you know, how fast this transition happens has a direct bearing on the pension plan and our ability to earn returns. We, we are a global investor. We are exposed to the global economy uh, for a very long period of time. We can't, um, you know, we don't have the luxury as a company to sort of say, hey, I'm going to, you know, I can I can manage the my own operations uh, and, and get to net zero as a company. But as a pension plan with 3,000 investments. We have to get all of those investments to to net zero. So for us, you know, um, the time is of the essence. We we have a lot of work ahead, and and every investor needs to sort of get started uh, on that pathway now. Because if we don't make uh, net zero by 2050, we are going to have um, some serious problems ahead of us. And Amy, I'd love you to answer this question too, because you are in talks with investors all the time. Uh, what do they need to see from a company's, you know, from an investor's perspective? What do companies need to be doing as they make these commitments? Well, I, I had the the benefit of also listening to two good, two strong answers here, but I will say I think that transparency is going to be key from the issuers to the investors because how we actually calculate not just scope one and two, but scope three emissions is largely undefined right now. There is no agreed upon methodology that every company is going to do. And I think that some of our most informed investors and issuers both know this. And so transparency around how you're calculating your emissions, what that looks like is gonna be key. I also think it's an understanding that not every single industry today is going to be able to transition. And on the other hand, there's some industries and sectors that will be able to probably go net negative that could actually go the other direction. And so this is going to take all of us working together. Um, I'd agree with Deborah's comments because I work for Canadian Bank. We obviously are very active in Canada as well as a result. But I find our energy clients some of the most informed and aware of the change coming. And I think that when we look at net zero, how each industry approaches that is a little different. And so with investors, I think asking for transparency, asking for clarity, the request for information, these are all reasonable requests that we should continue doing. This is where, again, that reporting comes in so that we're all speaking the same language. And then you can actually have a coherent conversation across clients and across investments within sectors. I think that's how we're going to move forward. And really, it's not about stopping um, to bank or stopping to invest, in my mind, in some sectors or another, I think the days of negative screening are long gone. It's more, how do we figure out the outperformers from the underperformers in this transition? Uh, I can't thank the three of you enough. It's been such a great panel. Uh, this was the road to net zero. You know, looking forward to watching you hold many people to account <laughs> and watching the change. Thank you so much for joining us, and I hope to see you again soon. Thank you all for joining the Road to Net Zero. We hope you enjoyed these conversations. A big thank you to all our speakers for a wonderful program. And a thank you once again to our sponsor, TD Bank, for making this virtual briefing possible. Most of all, thank you for being such an engaged audience. To rewatch any part of this event, you can come back to this website where the recordings will be uploaded. You can also access videos of all interviews on Bloomberg Live's page on YouTube. Thank you for watching.